Um, for today's colloquium, it's a pleasure to have Ron Kyle Gary La Cruz, who sort of runs the whole show with Northwestern. She's the <laughs> lawyer, Taylor, professor of material science and engineering, chemistry, chemical and biological engineering, physics, and astronomy. All of them. What it means is I don't fit in any department, so. <laughs> she, she started off her career winning a beauty pageant in Acapulco okay, as a teenager. She then went on to, and I don't pronounce this. I was a model. To uh, the <laughs> University of Colorado <laughs> in Mexico, where she got a bachelor's degree. She then went on and got her PhD under Sam Edwards at uh, Cambridge, uh, where she was a, what should we say, an academic sister to people like Yasna and Elliot Weed and Mike Cates. Um, she works. Uh, she's done fundamental research on DNA and electrolytes, on, um, guess, on, on all sorts of soft matter and self assembly. She's a member of the National Academy and the American Academy. And she's going to tell us about controlling the geometry and all that kind of Thank you very much, uh, Paul. So I am. Um, I'm going to give uh, a problem. I'm going to talk about a problem that has a lot of aspects of very classical uh, uh, physics and also some chemistry and everything. I have to first thank my collaborator, Graciano Bernisti, which now is in Siena College. And some simulations were done by um, a group of people. Now he's right now in Google and he's a professor in the uh, United Kingdom, I believe. And some of the synthesis is the group of Sam Stoop, with joint students and x-rays from the group of uh, Michael Betzig and his students at Northwest. So I'm going to have to define first, you know, uh, what these platonic solids are for the people who uh, is not familiar. They are uh, objects that are characterized, you know, they are composed by the same kind of polygon and uh, P, and they, are identic they have identical vertices and they have some connectivity like three, you know, uh, five, we can change depending on the uh, shape. There are five of them, you know, the, the tetrahedra, the cube, octahedra, dodecahedra, and icosahedra. And so they are very beautiful, they're very symmetric. And uh, the point in physics is that physicists have always liked to find them in nature. Since uh, uh, Kepler, for example, believing that the orbital of the sun planets had to follow this platonic solid uh, shapes, or Plato thought that there were elements associated with each of them. He didn't have anything for the dodecahedra. And uh, then it was associated with the, uh, with the cosmos. Then the ether theory, then there was no, nothing in the vacuum in the ether theory claim. And recently, some people thought that the explosion of Big Bang is a symmetry of a icosahedra, which the dual is a dodecahedra. So the point is that they had been looked for them you know, in nature because they are so elegant and uh, what would expect that, that nature has to follow some of these beautiful symmetries. But they do find them in nanoscience. And they had been observed in, in living world in the viruses. When the viruses are small, uh, well, they can be very geometrical, but then they grow and they can be spherical. But when they grow a certain size, they generally have this icosahedra shape. And icosahedra is, um, is the only platonic solid for a long time. It's ubiquitous in biology, in fact. And it's the same that the fullerenes are observing fullerenes, which are, you know, made of these um, hexagons, you know, and so. They, um, they pop out in nanoscience, and they also are observing some amphiphas that I'm going to describe how and why, where you have uh, bilayers of molecules that tails hate the water, and the head groups are charged, and they assemble and close, they have closed shapes. And we do have been trying. Do these things have all the same uh, shape? Are they, they always. Are they, they have different number of sides on them? No, and icosahedra has 12 vertices and 20 faces. Okay? Versus the other platonic solids that can have, uh, for example, the dodecahedra is a dual, and it has the opposite. It has 20 vertices and, and 12 faces. And yes, it's but made. But that figure there, it looks like they're hexagons, right? But the, yes. not everyone can be a hexagon. Can that's right, they are pentagons. So that's. Hexagons I'm going to show Yes, because you cannot tile on a sphere. So the reality is that you have, a, you have to have defects, and that's the key to understand buckling into a cosahedra. 
the defects. But um, they are, they have seen, when I talk about this, somebody sh gave me this uh, example of, um, of an animal that makes a shell that is a dodecahedra. So it's made of pentagons instead of triangles, like the cosahedra. So that is only one example. I was fascinated trying to look whether you can have shells, you know, close, close membranes that have other shapes, like the Archimedean solids, they are like truncated, that type of truncated platonic solids. Now you can have two types of polygons covering them, but the vertices are equivalent, and things get more complicated. There are some Johnson solids, there are 92 of them, I believe, they are more irregular uh, in shape, but they, they can have not equivalent vertices and so on, and even these and gonad phosphide, which is like half moons together. So they are, the question is why none of these shapes occur in these elastic membrane shells? And so that's what I'm going to the motivation of my talk. Are they at the molecular level some shells that are not icosahedra? And if they are not, I mean, why is the process? And you will expect that since the shells are always made of many proteins in biology, as opposed to just one type, you could find some other shapes? And the answer is yes. There are a lot of important shells that are called organelles. You know, they are like little micro-reactors where things get inside and catalyze and generate energy for the cells. Organelles are called. There are a lot of them that are non Okay. So, um, in the textbook, they're always drawn as icosahedra, but in the uh, 2010, around eight, they were discovered that they were polyhedra. And so here's an example of these microcompartments in the bacteria, microcompartments that obviously they are not icosahedra. So, you know, I wanted to, to work in this field. Even before I knew they were not icosahedra, I wanted to know what happened when you actually make a shell that has many proteins and so on. What is the structure it forms when it has to close into has a constraint? You know, there are very beautiful constraints when you close the surface. And I want to talk about them. Just they, they, they sort of look like they might just be irregular. Are they yes. They are. They are. Most of them are irregular. Some of them, the ones here, for example, they look more like a square or rectangular. These are called a square bacteria before, but they're not bacteria. These are called uh, archaea organisms, which means that instead of a bilayer, it's actually just one molecule with two heads. Okay, and these ones are. Um, you know, more regular, as opposed to the ones I show you. These are projections in 2D. So yes, you have very regular polyhedra. And there, they also occur with regular polyhedra. And the more favorite. Is, are they all exactly the same in some definite form, and they're looking odd because of projection, or are they just, they might have No, these ones have many shapes, uh, because you can see it here. They are, uh, they can have many shapes. Not necessarily the same shape. You have, but um, yes, yeah, so there's, it's not a deterministic the shape, which is something that fascinates me. Why, you know, if they are this, they have the same proteins, but if they do these micro compartments with one protein, they can close it. It's a spherical. If they do it with many proteins, they take all these shapes. So it gives more, you know, degrees of freedom to shape to form other structures. Okay. <coughs> so. Uh, it's a good question. So, but what I'm saying is more general. These ones are micron size. They are huge. They are these archaea organisms. They are they call square bacteria, and they also have triangular bacteria. Some of the things that people have noticed is that electrostatic has a lot to do with it. For example, here these triangular faces. If you get rid of the divalent ions, they become spheres. So what it means is that the electrostatic is causing them to be crystalline. Okay, because only something crystalline will be buckle faster than have some flat things. If it was liquid membrane, it would be just spheric. This one, the other thing that I like is a puzzle, or was a puzzle for biologists, is that the text would say, these are a square, but they actually, if you look at the x-ray, they, they are formed by crystalline structures that are triangular, that is in the real space or hexagonal in the food space. Okay? So they are made, they are squares made of channels, which is also a puzzle in thing. You know, why would they form that? And so, we were after the assignment, and I will show that we went, um, we do it by making by layers. We tried to see we were able to form these vesicles close, and what were the shapes, by mixing cationic and anionic by layers, because if you have opposite charge, they come together, and so they will form a bilayer. And so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll explain later how uh, we discover this, but what we find is that indeed, 
when they close, they are always hexagonally packed, the tails. Okay? So the, the, the type of crystallinity matter. And so when you do amphiphiles, I'm going to have to review the theory of amphiphile to show you how we, we find these, these um, morphologies and why they have these shapes. I hope that I will persuade you that it's something very general from some geometry. Before I go that, you know, when you have an amphiphile, you have um, uh, properties, for example, you have a young model, if they have elasticity, if they are um, crystalline, or they have also a bending, a membrane has a bending rigidity, how easy is to bend. So these models are what we use to describe, the, uh, say, the, the membranes. This is a fluid membrane, it doesn't have a young modulus, but it has a bending rigidity. When you close it by layer, you know, you have some ease to bend it. And if it's uh, crystalline, then it has a young modulus. And when it has a young modulus, then it will have possibilities to buckle and form this, these buckle shapes that are more uh, different. When this is small enough, the buckling is something very regular. This is some work of Nelson and Pelitti. Since 87, they were working in buckling of, of, of membranes. And that's what i would be using his models. His models are as follows. The amplifiers are defined by a Hamiltonian that is quadratic in the mean curvature. So for any shape you have, you can have two, or two uh, um, um, radius of curvature, R1 and R2. So if you deviate from the spontaneous one it has, if it's flat, the spontaneous one is zero. If it's already something curved, you might have another value. But it's quadratic on that, and the coefficient is the bending rigidity of the membrane. Then there is a higher order term, that is the Gaussian curvature, which is the product of the two radii, <coughs> with, a, with a coefficient that is the Gaussian rigidity. So these two parameters you know, define the shape that you will obtain if it was uh, liquid. How, how do I count orders? I, it's the factors of R inverse? This is the inverse, no. of, it's the mean curvature of the object. For example, if you have a cylinder, one of them will be, one radius will be final, the other infinite. No, I, so, my question is, yeah. how do I see that G is higher order? Oh, it's not that it's higher order or no, I mean it's a product of two radii if, 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 um, as opposed to one over R. But the main point is that people do not consider this term as important in most problems. Because if you integrate it over a closed surface, it's a constant. If this is a constant, the integral of the Gaussian curvature, there is a theorem. If it's an homogeneous thing, it's just 4 pi. It's a theorem of geometry. So this, this has never been very important for the science, but I will show you that it is very important for something that is heterogeneous in a second. So you, you said I order, but you didn't mean it. Oh yes, I mean, uh, yeah, sorry. I meant an important term, but it happens to be an important to keep in the model I'm going to talk about. Okay? So, sorry about that. Uh, and then there is the physics, is to add the, the, the elastic energy that you just expand, you know, and that again I use the model of um, uh, Nelson and Song in 88, where they make an infinitely uh, thin membrane, elastic membrane, that it has some parameters that are associated in the limit of very thin and incompressible, you can define in terms of the young models. So the final energy of a membrane is the bending one that I showed you before and the elastic one, this one. So these are the two components that you have to work with. So why do you get because of hydra first? Okay? So with this model, let's just talk about, you have the most close part structure, this triangular lattice where you have in each vertex one molecule. Okay, pack. This is a close pack into V. Again, as you mentioned, you cannot have it without disorder when you close it. Okay, so if you try to grab with a piece of paper a ball, it will buckle, right? It will spike up. So you need to have some defects in order to make a sphere. And those defects are these um, pentagons. So you have um, some theorems that relate for a hexagonal lattice, how many pentagons and heptagons you can have, that depends on the number of handles that this object has, the genus. So if it's closed without handles, the genus is zero. So you need only 12, this is the number of vertices that have five in these neighbors, and this is the number when they have seven. For a genus, zero has to be 12. So what is the minimum you can have? 
If there are 12 pentagons, zero heptagons are the minimum. Because if you have 13, you have to add another heptagon, right? If these are pentagons, pentagons generate a strain, okay? So you have a strain, they hate each other. So where do they go? If you have a sphere, you're going to have 12 of these pentagons that hate each other. Then where they go is they go to the corners of 12 verges of an inscribed icosahedra inside the sphere. So all these things that are spherically, crystalline, have icosahedral symmetry, right? Because these defects are on a screen. They are hate each other. And so there are 12 of them, this is the minimum. Like if you have genus 1, you don't need defects. You can actually take a, a, a tube and, and cover it with a, with a carton or whatever and close and it won't spike, right? But not for the sphere. So this, is, and this theorem tells you it doesn't matter where they are, they have to be 12. If, and it doesn't matter where the shape is, they have to be 12. Okay, so this is what um, leads right to the cosahedral shape in so ubiquitous, that everything that was spherically crystalline has to have a cosahedral symmetry, and there are 12 of them, so they are in this gravity cosahedra. And so what happens is that when, um, when they are sufficiently large, the sphere, they have to release a strain that grows quadratically with the size of the object. Take, take a round thing, okay, so the effect it's a continuum theory, this discretized, but if you take a, 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 a round disk and you divide it into six pieces and you take one sixth of it and you glue it, what do you get? You get a little cone, right? This is, if it was elastic and you could close it, it will remain flat, but if it's non-elastic, it will buckle. And so it will buckle uh, to release that elastic, elastic energy. So this defect goes to that. Okay? So now imagine there is a critical number that if, it, if, it's, if the radius is a small or the young modulus over the bending is a small so that this product is less than 154, remains flat, if it's larger, it buckles. And that's why it's plain if you want to see that, that, that when you have a, 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 say a virus which is made of these hexagons and pentagons, it will buckle into a cosahedra because these 12, simultaneously, these 12 defects that are non-screen will buckle and uh, give rise to this shape, okay? So that explains why because a hydro is so ubiquitous in this crystalline small structure. So that's it, so there's what, what happened when, what about if you have an heterogeneous system? And this is where um, you have to be more careful with these terms because if you have a system that has two Moduli, two young modulus because it's made of two different materials, elastic material. Like you close it and it's, it's, um, it's made of two components. So then you have, at each point, you can have a value of a different bending and stretching. So these are no functions of a space in the, in the surface of the sphere. Right? So, and these, um, also, you cannot take it out of the integral anymore, like in the case of the um, the one that is homogeneous, that the integral of the Gaussian curvature, which is the product two gives just a number. This is a theory of two. But now you cannot do it because the coefficient here depends on the position. So this is key to understand the shapes you can form if the system is not homogeneous. So you have to do the same with the elastic part. It's not homogeneous anymore. So the way we solve this is discretizing this Hamiltonian on a lattice and use the Monte Carlo to calculate the shape that is a minimum, okay, with the constraints. So I will show you that in, in the case when you have two components, you actually can buckle the structure into other shapes that actually have much lower energy than buckle into the cosahedra. Even though you still have the defects there, they prefer to do something else, like going to this structure. So um, this is the way you actually discretize this, you put a, a fixed, it's an elastic material, so you pick a fixed net and you close it and you assign um, in the triangles if you, if you uh, have a, a normal to it, the bending rigidity will be the angle between these normals, the coefficient is associated with this bending rigidity and if it was uh, the spring part, you just put uh, a spring constant around some length 
when you stretch it, you have the elastic pad. So you have these two things. And uh, these coefficients are being shown by this story. I, I use the model of Simon Nelson. They are associated with the young models and the bending rigidity of the structure. One thing to notice is that in this model, so we do it by Monte Carlo, you locally deform and you calculate what is the lowest energy state, and you go to the lowest energy state by, by uh, accepting or rejecting all of these moves when you have two components. So that's the way we sort of do it numerically. But one thing to notice is that this system, for example, has implicitly a Gaussian curvature in the model. The reason you can see that because if you have a, a subtle point that has zero mean curvature, you still have an energy associated to the bending. So it means this model implicitly has the Gaussian rigidity coefficient that is equal to minus the bending rigidity. And this is crucial to know why you can actually find this heterogeneous uh, structure. So let me, the, the way you do this, we show this, find the pattern that you get coupled with the shape of the shell. So here is one case where you're going to mix an heterogeneous system, one that is rigid, so that is flat, with another one that is already more uh, easy to bend, that is buckle. So what happens if you mix these two together and make one single shell? Suppose they are compatible, they love each other, they want to form a single shell. So the lowest energy structure is all of these shapes. So the person asks me, why is this really regular or not? These are the most, um, the most uh, probable shapes. This will be the one that is homogeneous. If it's homogeneous, can only take an icosahedral shape or remain spherical, the rigid. But as soon as you put a mixture increasing the percentage of this easy to bend one, then you can go through all of this polyhedra structure. Okay? So what you notice here is something that is very, um, uh, important in 2D geometry, which is forming three vertices. So basically, we start with this and we put, say, 5% of the flexible material, easy to bend. And so it comes together and forms lines. And these lines want to come and close to form the maximum number of faces, flat faces. So that's the way it buckles. So, yeah, so. Uh, what it means is that even if you put, if you were to make a shell with two components that they love each other, even if they love each other, they will segregate to decrease the elastic energy in the material, just because of the topology that is close. Okay. Uh, I, I guess I'm not sure I understand what's going on. Yeah. Do some bonds bend more easily than others? Yes. The, 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 the blue prefers to, to be buckled because it's easy to bend. And this one is more rigid. So, so say, for example, you get two proteins that by itself one is going to be more, more, easy, more difficult to bend. And then make another one that is more easy to bend because it has this younger, uh, lower modulus kappa to bend. And now you make a co-assembly of both of them. You, you go to your lab and you mix them that they co-assemble and close in a shell. They make like a, like a nano-reactor little thing. Is it just a random distribution of the yeah. easy and difficult? It, the, 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 the lowest energy state is this. I started at random, and I go to, by Monte Carlo, looking the lowest energy state, and they go to this. So no matter how it start, they always have something. They can be many shapes because it's a finite system, so there's no one single lowest energy state. But what is also always happens is that they form these three things, and they form lines. Lines that want to come together, so they aggregate. There are some hints in elastic material that if you mix two components, the elastic energy is lower if it's a stretch. For example, if you have an inclusion of some hard material inside soft one, it might elongate to decrease the elastic, the elastic energy that causes the, the combination. So there are some hints from metallurgy or elasticity theory that will tell you that they will prefer to form lines. But here it's amazing that they just immediately, you know, form these lines and they want to form the maximum number of facets structures. I call this fractionation of the shell. And I will explain why it's pure math actually. At the end of the day, it can be explained with math. Yes, without having to do the whole simulation. What happens if you fix the volume? Say you're encapsulating something and you need to constrain that. 
These, these materials, I have elastic energy, so you can never buckle something keeping the area constant or the volume constant. You have to pay something. You cannot change a sphere into the cosahedra keeping both, okay, area or volume. So these ones are allowed to stretch the bonds, so they change slightly the area. I'm not keeping, say, the solid angle of each particle constant. They can exchange that. I didn't do it without uh, stretching. Um, I don't know. I mean, I did one problem that uh, Paul edited my problem with electrostatics. In there, I keep the area constant. And I will show some pictures of that case, but that's more complicated because it had charge plus and minus. This is neutrality. Charge always adds more complications. <laughs> Because it's the one over our potential, and you have positive and negative, and they want to be together, and so on. But actually, that's the way to assemble things. If you have two proteins that don't like each other, it's very hard to bring them together. But if you make them of positive and negative, they might more easily come and form a coassemble. Okay? So that's why it's important to work with charge systems for these coassemble structures. Because, um, okay, because it's difficult to find them that they want to mix. Okay, is it clear? So these two components mix. I didn't put any preference. I put equal short range interactions between the blue and the red. So they like, in short range, they like the same way. The only thing they have is different elastic properties. One is more easy to bend than the other. That's the only thing. So basically it goes from this to this shape. And the question is how and why does it go like that? So you can form any shape you want really if you uh, fix the ratios of the red to one. For example, you can have all the platonic solids. The one that is more common are the, the ones that are not a platonic solids because you need sort of magical number of ratio of the blue to red to form the perfect platonic solid, okay? Because of the fraction. But if you don't fix that, most probably you end with something that is a polyhedron with these lines, fragmented things. Now, when we look at this, for example, this looks more like a tetrahedra uh, shape. It forms spontaneously at a given ratio of these two mechanical constants and fraction. So you need the fraction of the easy to bend and the ratios of the bending rigidity of one to the other. One has to be much more easy to bend than the other for the form piece. So in here, I make a, a, a plot of the, of the mean curvature, and it happened that the defects that in the buckling of the cosahedra is spiking, is spiking, is spiking out are sunken in. So it's not even, even related to the buckling of a regular um, a structure with the cosahedral symmetry. So even though it still has the cosahedral defects, uh, the defects there, and they, they, they don't move in this case, they are perfectly ordered, still doesn't, it buckles by folding and so on. So this is what I show here. And um, the other thing is, you know, in the evolution of little amount of percentage of the easy to bend to the higher value, you still have to keep low concentration in percentage for having these very fractal objects. If you have more concentration, it looks more like a cosahedra decorated and so on, which with the patches inside. So, why does that happen? So, as I said in the beginning, the question is higher order. In reality, before, when you don't have what is called geodesics, these are theorems, okay, of geometry. If you have this Hamiltonian and the integral of the Gaussian curvature, and you don't have what is called geodesics, which are curves in a curved space, that have different curvature than the actual object, okay? These are called geodesics. If you don't have that, then this term is zero. But if you have geodesics, it happens that it adds to the energy. So when you calculate the final energy of this structure, you have contributions that are lower the energy if you have lines. A lot of lines. Yes. Uh, do, do, you, do you look at, um, at only uh, things which are topologically equivalent to a sphere? Yes. I start with a sphere, but they go into these shapes. But it has G, the, the general, the, uh, the topology G is zero. So it can't, yes, by, by only. By the, but it could be that you have something with, with you know, the genus which would have lower energy. Given genus the one doesn't do anything, doesn't buckle, because it's a ceiling the torrent. And right. so that doesn't have buckling, unless you put compression or something on it. But 
but lower energy state is a perfect cylinder, so it will not cause a uh, distribution. They do have patterns in a cylinder, but of charge, if you have charge, plus and minus or whatever. If you just don't have anything, the elasticity, it doesn't give you a pattern in the cylinder. Yeah, okay? But I get a, 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 a torus, right? Then the torus, that's, yeah. a, that's what I need a cylinder, the torus. Because then the inside is negative curvature and the outside is positive curvature, so you expect. You know, we don't have. Of the in the elastic, you're right. If it's finite, yes. But I always, when I set the ceiling there, I'm thinking in a limit of infinity. Yes. You're right. If it has a finite donut, you might have some segregation in the internal structure. That might come as just pair of defects because you don't have pentagons. The pentagons, you know, that have a strain might be that you form pluses and minus elastic effects. And maybe if the material that is easy to bend has most probability to form defects, they might be the one that goes inside. Okay? Do you understand his question that it, in, a, in a cylinder I don't have monopotents, but it might form pentagons and heptagons coming together, pairs, defects, that might want to uh, release some strain locally because it's a final donut in the internal versus external surface. So I didn't look at that problem, but maybe yes, but it's not the type of the one that I, I was interested in the sphere in particular because of the buckle. Yes? What do you mean a surface that does not have a geodesic mean a bridge? And I mean, if I have a, a spherical object, this is defined for, a, a, for something of genus zero, that has some uh, mean curvature, say, and you have another curve that is not, say, in the, in the equator that has the same curvature of the sphere. Right? You have a component of a geodesic uh, curvature that in this theorem, you know, has a contribution. What, what, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm very, I don't understand what you... You said that something the surface didn't have a geodesic, but all surfaces have geodesics. If it's homogeneous, why would it have a, a geodesic uh, lines forming? If I have just an homogeneous sphere and I don't have any curve inside. By geodesic, you mean the blue lines? Yes. Okay. Another component. Okay. My system is made of blue and red. And, and if I have, have yeah. if I don't have a forming lines, I don't have an extra contribution from this term. And so basically, it's not that this is formal, but it can explain why it wants to fraction, uh, fr uh, decompose like that. So basically, if you put the parameters on this energy, you know, the Gaussian has two hard and soft, this integral, and then you have um, the extra contribution from the integral of this part, soft and hard, and if these parameters have the right values, you can show that you minimize this by having more lines than C. You have to have this number less than zero. So the boundary of the domains you want to have has to make this less than zero, has to be three at least. So it wants to form to decrease the energy coming from that, um, you know, Hamiltonian. If it's closest sphere G zero, it wants to form these lines. And that's what this tells you. So, you know, if you put line tension, now suppose you do start changing the component of the solvent, so you make the red and blue incompatible, they will eventually form droplets inside, which has the lowest ener interfacial energy. It's very, it's very unusual to have something that wants to spread, right? And so if you put a line tension, some penalty, on the interface between the blue and the red, eventually it wants to form droplets inside that have more spherical shape. Right? So you do, you do have find some, when you increase the line tension between the red and blue, suppose you make them incompatible, they eventually will like to, to form these droplets and channels back. But in, the, in a long regime, they remain like that, and they, you have to pass like a first of transition. You have a critical value of the line tension, and they form an nucleate. So the lines disappear in the, in the structure. So this is what we were able to see. Now we did try to do some experiments. And as I said, in order to assemble the components, red and blue, or two components, you have to use charge. And this I'm going to show you just because this is the paper that, that, that Paul edited for me. So we started thinking we can make vesicles of positive and negative head groups. 
for example. So you took the sphere and you put three plus to minus one charges. And you can show that indeed, you know, these things can have lower energy going to an icosahedron. This is keeping the area constant between the sphere and the icosahedral form when you compare the energies. But these, these objects are actually don't have icosahedral symmetry anymore, don't have rotational symmetry because the charges, you know, they are one to arrange to lower order, so they have some directionality how they are arranged in the, in the vertices. So when you mix the two things, I told you that electrostatics with elasticity gets more complicated. If you were to have, uh, say, here in this case are eight, three plus positive particles. And then you have to get electroneutral. So you have to get a ratio 3 to 1 of the negatives. So there is an old problem that is called the Thomson problem. But if you were to have charges in a sphere like that, where electrons neutralize the, three, the plus charges, and they are 8, they will go to a rotated, uh, how do you say, cube, the position. That's called the Thomson problem. So that's what I call the metallic bonding, the sphere is like that and they just go to that. But now if I put electrostatics, the, the order of this sphere, the, these charges is totally different than the Thomson problem. Because this is ionic bonding. So in here, you have positive and negative, and you know, cannot assume the other one is a continuum. So this is when you control the shape. So you go from, a, from something where the charges are in the cube rotated, if electrostatic is strong enough, it becomes a cube. So that you can, you can, by controlling the, the strength of the interaction, Coulomb interaction, which you can do it by changing the constant of the media of something, you can actually control the shape in principle. Okay? So this is very realistic. Now we, we actually do try to assemble this. I said I need to, to assemble positive with negatives. I, to assemble something that has more than one component, you need to put, you need to use charge. So here, this is something that in water alone, it can only form what is called a micelle. The tails are in the center and the heads are bulky in the side. And then you mix it with something that is not water soluble because it cannot dissociate charge. The tails are carbons that hate the water. So what happens if you mix them? It's just like that. You mix them in the lab, in water. And so what you find is that you find that they form these vesicles, these focal vesicles. So to understand why they form these vocal vesicles, and they are not, they are polyhedral. They are not really all icosahedral. Some of them are icosahedral, but many of them have all very different shapes. So you have to understand what happened in electrostatics. In water, you dissolve salt, right? Because the bonding between two charges, which if you were in solid state, like in ionic bonding without mm -hmm. water, is generally of the order of 100 kT, the energy to bring two charges together at a distance d between the size of the atoms. So this is ionic bond. If you have water, the electric constant relative goes to 80. So the energy to bring them together is equal to kT at a distance LB, which is 7 answers. So when you bring them very close, the energy can lower. But if you have very dilute salts, they never come together because we prefer to have kT, right? So the average distance between them in the solution is larger than seven angstroms, they prefer to be free all over. So that's why you dissolve the salt. If you add a lot of salt, you precipitate it. But what happened in, the, in, the, in this ionic system is that you are at an interface of water and a low electric constant. So from your Jackson book of electrostatics, you will know that the interaction between the charges on the surface is the mean the electric constant. So what it means is that it's a stronger than in water, but it's not as strong as ionic solid <coughs> system. It's around, for a separation that we get of five angstroms, it's around uh, per one charge, 10 kT, and you have three of the, um, you have uh, three to one, so it's about 10 kT. But what happened in these cases is that the tails of the, the head groups have one tail, and then you have other, other three tails, of the negatively charged. So it's basically just forming a many tails of factor. And they are coming together the heads so that you make the, like if you put pressure in an, in an amplifier, they crystallize the tails. 
So what we find by X-ray is that these structures of cationic and ionic lipids that are supposed to be liquids, they're actually crystalline because of electrostatic. So when you crystallize the tails, you gain per carbon like two kps. So you have, say, four tails of factum because you have a neutral three plus with one tail and the other minus, you have like 50 kp or so. So it's a very large energy that you gain by crystallizing. So that's why they crystallize. And indeed, we find them that they crystallize. Now, when you change the fraction of charge that they can have between them, they can go from you know, this buckle of faceted structure, open up into ribbons, and then back to close structures. So I'm going to tell you that, I'm just going to tell you the point that this is a rectangular C phase that cannot support an sphere. These are hexagonally closed pack tails. And you know how the biologist said, only if it's hexagonally closed pack, we get the structures, even the, 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 the squares and other things. But in order to close the sphere, you have to have this, this hexagonal tail. This is happened for these systems, you know, and it happened also in biology, so I assume, you know, it's pretty important to have hexagonal path to close something. So, I'm not going to bore you that how we calculate this, because I, uh, I don't think I have much time, but basically, we do calculate the degree of ionization for quassemble them and try to calculate how they pack in a flat structure. And um, the black peaks show that it's a bilayer, and then it has some domain sizes that are crystalline because you have high black peaks. So there are domains, crystalline domains inside this buccal structure of our structure. They are of certain size. The size of the domain you can extract it from the X-ray. And full atom simulation, you can see when you have certain fraction of charge, you do get hexagonal structures by layers. If you have too much charge, the plus and minus, they overlap, and they lose the hexagonal packing that you find when they are mix of less charge to another. So the consequences is, you know, that you have for certain values of charge fractions, you have hexagonal structures, and for other fractions, you have rectangular C for the tail. And so we have something that's called reentrant transition here. Depending on the pH controls the amount of charge fraction. Like here, this means 30% charge of the negatively charged blue. And the, 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 the T plus have a 100% charge on this side. So this controls the fraction of charge on the, on the structure. So you go from triangular to rectangular C to triangular. So you have as a function of the charge fractions of the positive and negative. Okay? So by changing the ratio, you change the, the structure. So this is where you do a model and you find that indeed these shapes form, this is formed when something called Martini model, you close the bilayer and you subtract a little bit of water and get the equilibrium because you cannot do it with constant area of water. So you have to remove a little bit of water, it's supposed to let it permeate, and then you see the shape. And so the shape it forms, it looks very much like what you get with the continuum model. Why would I say the continuum model does these microscopic things? Because if you notice where it bends, this region is very disordered and thinner. So in continuum mechanics, when a, when a system is very thin, it has very different bending. It scales like the thickness cube, as opposed to something is thicker, right? So these areas are much easier to bend. They are naturally, they are different mechanical properties. And this is happening because you have fraction of charge that can distribute differently locally in the structure, okay? So you can make these things. Now I'm going to try to summarize saying, yes, and you can actually explain why the smaller ones are more faceted than the large ones. The large ones look like a spherical. It's not that they are really spherical, because the X-ray gives us a size of a domain, crystalline domains. And the crystalline domains have a particular characteristic size of 25 or 25 nanometers squared. So if you take tiles of that size and you close it, it's going to look more fragmented than if you take a tile of something very big. So this also you can see that that happens in, in some of the structures when they are small, you can look at more fragmented like that. And then these are the ribbons that form. You know, these ribbons are very interesting. So twisting, your um, elastic and, and um, electrostatic energies combined, 
this you can in biology you know you want to say why can something change shape or form or not what are the values of the energies and people know that all the energies are very close to each other so that things can have change like here is the pH the fraction of charge you know, basically they're always of the order of KT, three or four KTs, the, the, the heads in the water, but then they have the tails. So what we did is to start changing the ratios of the tail to, to change the fraction of the electrostatic part that brings them together, that can rearrange, versus the crystallization. And see whether, if they become very large of the crystallization, the strong force that crystallizes wings, if you are able to have polyformisms, changes in structure. And the answer is, no, you cannot. If the, if the tails become larger, say that 20, like here, 22, you only get the lowest energy structure that is a rectangular C of the tails. If you have a smaller tails ratio, you get the reentrant. And this is a 2 plus and minus 1 instead of 3 plus. In the 2 plus and minus 1, you can have actually three phases, changing the fraction of charge of the positive to negative. Just changing the fraction. Right, with the pH. You go from triangular, rectangular C, rectangular P, triangular, rectangular C. So all of this occurs only in this area. Afterwards, it just becomes crossing wind by short range interaction. So electrostatic is okay there. And now I'm just going to conclude saying you why, if you were to have a one to one square charge, you don't form this buckle structure. So we put an emulsion and we put pluses and minus one to one plus one minus one instead of three to one, just one to one, and then shrink the, shrink the shape. And it's, it's, a, in a, it's a square, one to one, has to form a square lattice. When you go smaller and smaller, eventually, boom, it has to win and become hexagonal. So electrostatics cannot keep it a one to one, and just the short range packing wins and so on. So this is to say that, you know, um, it doesn't, in these cases, it, it, it can happen three to one, because you form hexagonals. But if you were to have a uh, rectangular or square lattice, this buckling will be very, very restrictive. And that's why you think we observe experimentally ribbons and flat things when your tails are not hexagonal. Okay? So, uh, you know, you can do the same theorem if you want to do the topology of closing and a square lattice. And then you will have, this is charge, you will have defects that have five or three. You have the same Euler uh, rules. Instead of 12 defects, you need eight that have uh, 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 three, three neighbors as opposed to no. And it's impossible to get them to live happily <coughs> in an elastic media when you put charges. Because as you have a defects, you know, you always, the neighbors of charge are very restricted. You cannot put here red. Because then here, you know, you have blue to red, so you cannot minimize the defect. Unless you have very complicated mixed defects, then you can actually do it, and this is very hard. So most probable things shatter, like in ceramics, when they are ionic and not hexagonal. Okay? Yes? Uh, in one-to-one cationics, there are um, uh, vesicles. Which vesicles? Yes, but they don't have equal charge. They have pl more plus than minus. Uh, are you talking about the Thomas M? And they have holes in the corners of the cosahedra. So that's where the pores form to get rid of the water. They have excess charge. And that's a different mechanism because the topology changed now. It's not in gen genome zero. The ones of Thomas M that Nelson worked on are not, are cosahedral shapes where the pores, the 12 vertices, have excess charge. And if you have perfect electroneutrality or add salt, they disappear. So they're in a stable mine. I go to five, uh, 500 millimolar of salt and they're stable because it, they are self screen plus minus plus minus. And I don't need the holes to form because of hydrogen shape. So in, if you're talking about the one-to-one -one of Thomas M, they have holes in the vertices. I have to I have a picture. They is have- Is that nice triangular or square? That is a triangular also, actually. But it is not clear that they are really crystalline, but it has a final modulus. So they buckle when they have micron size. Mine are buckled at 100 nanometers. Very small, and they don't make the holes. And they are stable at high salt. So it's a different mechanism. 
Yeah. So anyway, but that's a good point. So you know, I conclude that we have all of these polyformisms. You know, when changing um, the crystallinity of the closed shells, and um, we show that do not form in this um, square lattice or they are very difficult to form because the defects have to be very, very uh, complicated to be able to, to, to pack something in a closed sphere uh, when you have ionic structures. And that we demonstrate that these platonic and alchemia and irregular shapes can occur, arise spontaneously, buckling the structures, when you have more than one component with different mechanical properties. And you know, you will think that the large spherical or icosahedra are more ubiquitous indeed, because this buckling occurs only when you have a sufficiently large ratio between <coughs> the two bendings of the two components. So you know, are there very thin parts forming or very different bending? Nevertheless, once you form this polyhedra, you will think they are much more functional <coughs> because they have all these broken symmetry. So they have shapes that could be recognized or they concentrate components. You know, in biology, many things are very weakly concentrated. So by actually this mechanism, you can concentrate components say, in the vertices or edges. And so that will think that is more uh, functional. And the experiments show that indeed, you know, we find these, these shells forming in quasimbol cationic and ionic mixtures. And uh, thank you for your attention. I was trying to look for the Thomas M structure. I just to show you the holes, and they have it in their papers. But uh, I don't know if I have it here. These are just if you ask me some other questions. <laughs> no, sorry, I don't have it with me. But it has holes that one. Yeah. Is there experimental evidence that? That's a very good point. We tried to put some gold things in one of them. We never found it. That is the mechanism of this polyhedra. So maybe there is another reason why they form <coughs> square bacteria being triangular. Okay, because it will form naturally. Something that is a square will naturally form into a cube when it buckles. If it was not plus and minus, it would just form a cube because it had eight defects. Where are the eight defects in the position of an inscribed cube? So the defects will buckle up into Q. So only the ones that have the 12 defects that you have to have six nearest neighbor as the lapis buckle into because a heap. But you know, then they define it. But what they found is that those square bacteria, this cubely thing, they actually have hexagonal lattices. So that's an evidence that it's not the mechanism of an square buckling into a Q. about this mixture of blue particles and red particles. You present this beautiful picture uh, yes. such that creates the impression that at every particular ratio of red, red to blue, you have one particular pic picture of opacity. Do you no. have no. also yeah. cases when they coexist or when there is yeah, multitude that, of... That's uh, why I did the pH. The pH tells me different fraction of charge. At pH, for example, seven, uh, five till seven, I have around 30% charge only of the negatively charged. And the other is, is neutral. So the shell arranges itself to have a certain concentration of the ratio plus to minus in the flat place and, and other charge in the other regions according to the simulation, okay? Experimentally, the only thing we can say is that when it's, the X-ray is hexagonal, it's closed, and when it's not hexagonal, it opens up. But my question is That's about your simulation. In simulation. Yeah, in simulation. In no real <laughs> systems. He told me there's no real simulation. Yeah, in no real systems. Uh, I am too primitive to think okay. about anything real. Okay. Uh, if you fix the ratio of components, red to blue, Yes. You always obtain, suppose you run several times oh, the car. No. You always obtain the same thing or different? No. This is the question. Are the shells that form the same always? The answer is no. These are finite systems and they have lower states 
that can switch and I cannot get them out. I just do annealing and I get the zero temperature that my simulation does. But if I start with another distribution... But at zero temperature, it is one solution. No. I have found okay. for dispersed, I have many. But it always lines and it always three and it always wants to close. Okay. So the theorem of the integrals of these Hamiltonians is still follow that it wants to close, to fractionate and so on. But not the shape. But they look very similar. Okay? Okay. They don't have the same rotation. It's a finite object, there are other energies, and it can get cut there. So I do my best, but never succeed yeah. <laughs> with getting the same shape. Anyway. So, I have a more general question about your, your motivation. Is it, it, it seems to me, if I understood correctly, you're primarily trying to explain existing natural Actually, structures. no. I was interested in seeing heterogeneous structures of different charge. So I started mixing positive and negatives. And then from then, I said, you know what, maybe they have other mechanisms because I realized that because I, when I just put a sphere, because a hydra, because a hydra were lower, but I realized with charges you break rotational symmetry, because a hydra is symmetry. So there I started asking what happened if I have just two components that were mechanically different. And then I got the shapes, and then I went to a biologist and I told him I found the shapes, and he told, and I said, they must be ubiquitous, and he told me, no one will believe you, no one has seen them. And then I look at them, and they were there. So it was the perverse. Okay, but my, my, my question look, was, but besides explaining yeah, uh, existing... Some possibilities of explaining. Uh, the possibility of explaining existing natural structures, are you also motivated by uh, somehow finding new structure origin of life <laughs> origin of life that's not true because that's very fair trendy work the thing is that care organisms are believed to be the first places where you nucleated concentrate materials to generate life so um, no the archaea came afterwards when I gave a talk and somebody told me have you look at the spore bacteria and they have these shapes. And then I look at carefully the literature and what was more surprising was that they were triangular. And that's the thing I pick up for the other things. But no, I was not motivated by the origin of life or any of that more deep question. I was just motivated by elasticity theory, chart electrostatics, and constraints. Yeah. Okay. Another question? Yeah. Does a balancing make a difference? You did everything with closed surfaces. Suppose you took a bound a flat surface, a boundary homogeneous now with your two components in it, and then blow it, right? Make it a hemisphere, let's say. Does, does the boundary make a difference? Or you're still if, a Yes, yes, in a sense, you know, the boundary has, you know, some earlier properties and so on itself, yeah. you know, so you will have segregation of things and yes. Like for example, to be honest, if you take the flat disk, which is called the buckling of, the original buckling is just the flat that makes a cone before Nelson really. Nelson is the first one who understood the buckling to cause a heat run. But he uses the flat case at the model. If you put two components there and you have a defect, even if it's not solved where the sub one goes and does it goes to the, to the uh, center, to screen? And so on. So these problems, you know, I, I don't know when you, it depends how you call it. I mean, the normal thing for the, I'm doing a continuum theory with the simulation, is just to take the disk when you cut it and have that shape. That's equivalent to what I'm doing when I put a defect in the flat case. And there, with two components, I don't have a solution of where the soft and hard go in the flat case, before it buckles and after it buckles. So it is as simple as that example. It's not. Thank you.